Okay, so um, I know we already had a beautiful, beautiful prayer, but if you'll indulge me, um, I'm very politically incorrect, and um, I'm not in shame to do so. So I find that I speak better if I pray before I speak. So, Father God, I thank you that we live in a country where we are free to proclaim our faith. I thank you, Father, that um, these people are here tonight because they truly believe in the greatness of this nation that you've given to us, and I pray that the words that you want me to speak would be spoken and everything else would fall to the wayside. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, I want to share on what is an issue that's near and dear to my heart because I do believe that education is the linchpin issue. And the reason that I say that is over my decades of being involved in education, educational policy, what I have seen is that it's virtually impossible when we are indoctrinating 88 to 90 percent of our children with our own tax dollars into ideologies that are hostile to what most of us in this room would adhere to, um, it's virtually impossible then to move society in the correct direction. Um, I also want to encourage us because we just came through these political battles and there's a tendency sometimes to get discouraged and to uh, stop fighting. This is not the time to do that. And especially because we're weighing into these important elections coming up for, uh, for the school board. So I think that this is the perfect time to re-engage, re-mobilize, activate, get people involved because I believe education is a bipartisan issue that parents across all dimensions, different demographics, they all care about what their children are being taught and having control over what their children are being taught. So my presentation tonight is uh, the hand that rocks the cradle, and if when I do this, if you just move to the next, because uh, I don't know that I have control of it up here. But um, basically, I do believe the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. So um, Abraham Lincoln and I say it's credited to, because there is some question as to who actually said this, but it's still a great quote, that the philosophy in the schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of the government in the next. Um, and we have seen that. Uh, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. Because have we become a generation, a nation of socialists, the Bernie Sanders socialists? I mean, we see what's happening with the millennials and on down. But you know, what's interesting to me is that um, socialism is something that seems to be adopted by not just Bernie Sanders and not just millennials. I, I would venture to guess that Hillary Clinton and all the other Democrats are socialists, and unfortunately, a lot of the Republicans are socialists. It's what I call a provide for the general welfare ideology, and that is not what our Constitution says. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. There's a big difference between provide and promote, is there not? And we have lost that distinction. You can jump to the next slide. Um, and so what I call is we're in a battle today for tyranny versus liberty. And I don't think that I'm being extreme when I say that. Um, tyranny today, what we believe in is big government. We think big government is good. We think that the role of government is to provide. So every time that the government takes tax dollars and doles it out in redistribution of wealth or control of ideology through our pocketbooks, we say that's a good thing. I say that's a loss of liberty. Um, we, we, every industry that's regulated by the government and provided for through public tax dollars is in fact a form of socialism. So you don't have to sit here and think very long to start realizing how much socialism has been steeped within our society. And, and I already mentioned that I don't think Bernie Sanders is the only socialist. Public education, which used to be encouraged by the government, if you think back to the Northwest Ordinance, it talks about education being so important, shall forever be encouraged. That's promote. That goes back to the framework that our founders had about the Constitution and the role of government. It is not provide. When you move it into a compulsory, 
tax-supported education where they are controlling ideology content and they are forcing, which government is basically forcing with the point of the spear. If you study any of the, uh, the founding documents, the Federalist Papers talking about the sword of control, that's what they're doing with the tax dollars. And then they're controlling ideology. So in other words, that is socialized education. And we've seen that as much as I hate Common Core, I'm actually in some level grateful for it because it has started to kind of awaken people to realize how expansive the control, even from the federal end where constitutionally there is no framework or basis for the federal government to have authority or jurisdiction over education. Um, that falls to the purview of the states and the people. But we're still doing this and, the, and so that control is rampant. The role of government is to promote education, and I already touched on that with the Northwest Ordinance. It is not to provide. Government is, uh, and I'm going to give you a couple quotes here. This is kind of giving you the framework of where we were at the time of our nation's founding. George Washington said that government is neither reason nor eloquence, it's force. Mm -hmm. And force like fire is a fearful servant and a dangerous master. Is that something that we want to give more and more control to? See, government doesn't exist in and of itself. Government is something that it only exists for every power that it acquires. There has to be an equal liberty, right, or freedom that we, the people, relinquish to the government. And that's why a large, expansive governmental control is dangerous. And Jefferson said that when the people fear the government, that is the definition of tyranny. But when the government fears the people, that's the definition of liberty. So you see what's hanging in the balance. And I'll leave you with the last quote was Madison. Madison, who, and, and in case you haven't noticed, all of these are great Virginians. Um, so we, his statement, Madison, who's known as the father of the Constitution, he said that we should take alarm at the first experiment of our liberties. Because when we allow error to become steeped in precedence, it leads to tyranny, and those who submit to it become its slaves. So when we allow precedent year after year after year of expansive federal government control of uh, education or even the type of ideological constraints that are being put forward even at our local level, that is tyranny, and those who submit to it become its slaves. Um, why is education, you can go ahead and flip, why is education so crucial? So we, we don't have to think very far throughout history to realize examples of how you sway society through capturing the hearts and minds of the next generation. I mean, Hitler's youth is a prime example because legislating viewpoint discrimination is somewhat difficult. Um, but if you can indoctrinate through education, it can be done much more covertly and under the radar. And this has been happening for decades and decades and decades. I mean, I can tell you when I served on the state board, um, I actually had numerous death, th death threats. And you're like, well, what, what were you doing that was so egregious that you were getting death threats that I was having to report to the FBI? Well, I was doing crazy things like saying our students were all going to learn and memorize the Declaration of Independence. They were going to study unalienable rights, self-evident truths, the laws of nature, nature's God. I actually had history professors from around the nation start writing me saying, stop trying to indoctrinate our children with your religious ideology, which I had the pleasure of writing back and saying, those are not my words. Those are Thomas Jefferson's. Um, which, by the way, if you read New York Times and Associated Press, they say, I hate Thomas Jefferson, which, you know, another reason why we don't listen to the liberal media. I love it that Trump outed them, that they just lie. Um, so anyway, why, is the, why was I getting death threats? Because this is such a linchpin issue. It is a zero-sum issue. You can go ahead and switch. Um, so how bad, how far down the road are we? Um, and, and we are we're far down that road. I'm sure most of you who are dealing with the family uh, life education curriculum issues here, um, we have problems, Fairfax ISD, you're not alone. I mean, I get calls all the time. Um, 
which actually I have started an organization, NERDGAD, which uh, our, our goal and our function, and I will be talking about this more, is to push back the liberal progressive ideology, protect our children's First Amendment rights. Um, if anybody would want one of these flyers so you can read about it and get, um, Steve has some, so if you go ahead, he'll be passing those around as I'm finishing up talking. If you want to go ahead and start passing them, Steve, that's great. But um, basically, Fairfax ISD, you guys are fighting with the family life education uh, issue. They're not even wanting the parents to know what's going on. Dallas-Fort Worth ISD, in the heart of the Bible Belt, okay, the heart of the Bible Belt, um, they have controlled so much that they're not even telling their parents what the children are being taught. And the Attorney General is having to weigh in and force them to disclose the content. Why in the world would they not want to, at minimum, tell the parents what they're being taught? Hmm, I wonder. They, they have found that the librarian in the kindergarten section has 35% of the books are um, transgenderism for kindergartners. Does that make sense? You have 5% math, 7% science, oh, but 35% transgenderism. Um, Oregon, there's a student in, I can't tell a lot of details about what we're dealing with, but um, there are young students, middle school students, that are acquiring STDs on school property because they are acting out and experimenting with the sex ed curriculum that they're told as far as experimenting um, what their attraction, gender attraction is. Um, these are serious major problems and it's epidemic. Um, the compulsory sex education policy push, it's a huge problem and, um, and so this is something they've been doing since the 1940s. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Kinsey Institute, but the Kinsey Institute, which is based on really one table, which was basically child abuse being documented, and they used that data um, to document all the sex education that has now come out of CECAS, that has come, uh, which Planned Parenthood supports. It all comes out of one source, and that's what's filtering into these schools. EBSCO, which is a national a database, they're finding parents all over, finding that their kids are being exposed to hardcore pornographic material while they're on the website supposedly studying the curriculum material. So these are major problems happening. Um, if you haven't been following, the American Library Association is staunchly controlled by the other side. And, um, and so they are working night and day to make sure that there's constant uh, indoctrination and they're doing things like transgender reading hour for pre-K students, for pre-K children. So you have your little three and four year olds coming into the library and they have reading time, but it's by a drag queen. Um, and so, and, and I already talked about the percentage of library books. This is problematic because a lot of parents, even if you deal with the sex ed content, a lot of parents never know what their children are reading when they go into the library and they check books out or maybe don't even bring the books home. So there's zero parental oversight. And this is not by chance, this is intentional. If you look at Common Core and what they did in changing the algorithms in math, why in the world would you have to change long division? It, it's been the same forever. Well, because it does a huge wedge between the ability of parents being able to work with their children on their homework assignments. So once again, it pushes the only authority figure within their life are the parents in the schools and it locks the parents out. It is time that we start standing up in droves and saying no more. I will not tolerate this anymore. So you can go to the next, um, I'm finishing up here. So that's part of the reason why, well that is the reason why um, NERCAD is, uh, which because we need an organization where we are organizing together, circling the wagon, so to speak, to have options for their liberal agenda. Um, policy is one, so the Pearl attack, it's a three-prong attack, policy is one. This summer, um, in response to uh, Elizabeth had called and others had called about what was going on with uh, Fairfax, so I drafted um, a resolution with the help of other individuals and, um, and we got this resolution um, I debated at the RNC in uh, the summer in Austin, Texas, and there was a lot of debate within the resolutions committee where the press is not allowed to be in there. Um, and it was shocking, the debate that took place. 
trying to kill the resolution. But I'm happy to say that I won that debate, it went to the floor, and it unanimously passed in July at the RNC. The position now, formally, of the RNC is to ask every legislative body, every local school district, to require that the default of this salacious material is that it will not be taught unless there is a proactive opt-in of both parents instead of the default being that it is taught. Really quickly, educational resources uh, to provide training materials and alternative curriculum. The problem is um, they are driving the proverbial school bus and we are not. When you have NASB, which is the National Association of School Board and Educators, and you have the NEA and other groups who are doing all of the training for the teachers and the school board members and everything, and we are silent. There's no alternatives. We need to develop alternative training tools for that, for the resources, alternative curriculums to go into the school curriculum for the schools to be able to choose good options, healthy options, instead of what's being pushed down their throat. Um, and as a last resort, but maybe not, because these cases have gotten so egregious, litigation. We need to, I will tell you as an attorney, one of the things that has grieved my heart is I've seen the liberals time and time again Take, they won't take no for an answer. They go to the Supreme Court and they try to get their agenda pushed forward, whether it was started out with sodomy and then it was a Obergefell, and whatever the issue is, they keep going. Starting out with Roe v. Wade, they push, they push, they push. And if they get a no, they fundraise on that. And they talk about how Rome is burning and then they go back again. Whereas conservative groups, a lot of times, we look at it and think, oh, it's too high of a hurdle. We can't get past it. The Supreme Court's going to knock it down. Well, not that anymore. And we need to be taking these cases where our children are literally suffering child abuse at the hands of these districts and these states that are passing obscenity exemptions and other things, allowing this material before our children and our grandchildren, we need to stand up, we need to hold them accountable. When EBSCO says that they're gonna bring hardcore porn into our children's lives, enough is enough. No and so we need to stand up, we need to unify, and we need to litigate. And so we've put together, we're putting together a team of affiliate attorneys around the nation to take on these cases where we need to stand up to the ACLU and other organizations that are stealing our children. So um, that's why, and you can go to the last slide, um, Basically, I, so I have to take one moment to just brag because I did homeschool my children or they went to private Christian school. I was one of the lucky ones that, that I was able to do that and made it a priority because this is a thing I know. Monopolies do not work, we know that, but yet we use it with our greatest asset, our children's minds. And that's what's happening with socialized education. And so um, this, this statement of working today to save our children's tomorrow actually was coined by my son. Um, and so I'm very proud of, of my children who were homeschooled and I'm proud to say they're still loving and serving the Lord even though they have Ivy League degrees, so it can be done. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm asking you to join the movement. This is a movement, this is a cause. Because if we can reclaim our children, if we can reclaim our children, then not only do they have a future, we have a future and our nation has a future. So thank you, God bless you, thank you for being here. And do I have a few minutes for questions? Okay, a few minutes for questions. Okay. We have a hand as front and center. Go ahead and stand up. Do you know when the school boards, uh, they just voted to have a new curriculum for family life? And do you know when it'll go into effect? No. Um, yeah, Elizabeth Schultz walked in and she is on the board. Yay. And so she Elizabeth says now. This, this is I was why, there, Elizabeth. This is why this issue is so huge. I truly believe that the power structure of government should not be from the top down, from the bottom up. I think school board is way more important than United States Senate. 
Um, the power needs to be at the local level. So these are the races coming up. We need to keep Elizabeth on. We need to take more seats. We need to be informed and engaged. And I think we can, because I, I do think this is a bipartisan issue. Any other questions? Uh, yes, hi, thanks for coming. Um, it, you made a very good point about they're using our tax dollars against us, and they have a monopoly. So one way is trying to um, change what they're doing with the monopoly. But the other one is breaking the monopoly, and that means vouchers. So. I don't hear much from so, the Republican Party about vouchers. Right. Because if we could take our tax dollars and send our kids someplace else. Okay, so so I, um, the thing, and, and yes, I understand, I mean, parental rights is a huge issue, school choice is a huge issue. One of the things that I've advocated for more is um, something that has not actually passed any jurisdiction. I do know there were some legislators in Texas that were willing to carry it. It was called the Education Emancipation Act. And what it was, was a tax exemption. And that may seem like it's a um, semantic issue, but it's not. Because what that does is it keeps the money in your pocket. It's never the government's money. It never enters any kind of government control or regulation. It frees up new dollars, and, um, and then it allows parental choice. Now the reality is you're never going to get enough money out of those exemptions for your property tax to defer full private tuition or maybe even home, I mean maybe some of the homeschool curriculum, but staying home to homeschool. But what it does do is it gives money that's not there currently. And, and once you even have a few coming out of the system, then you have competition. That's what I was talking about. What you want to do is you want to allow the free market competition because when you start having people be able to make choices, then what also happens is it forces the public schools to now compete as well, which is a win-win. Um, because quite frankly, we're not in a place to be able to deal with all the students if everyone does a mass exodus. So we, ha I think moving in that direction um, Freeman, I'd be happy to send you sample legislation, the Education Emancipation Act. Right now, though, Virginia doesn't seem to be proactive on educational policy changes at all. Um, I think we have, what, like seven, nine charters even? So, um, so doing this in other states is probably the best way to start to try to, to maybe get Virginia's attention. Yes? Um, th first of all, thank you for your tireless work in this area. You are correct, there's nothing more important than our kids. So, do you see this pornification of our children at private and religious schools as well, or is this like strictly a phenomenon of uh, taxpayer-supported public schools? Oh no, um, when I said 88 to 90% of our children being indoctrinated, um, that, that is definitely a minimum number, because we do see it within the public schools, without exception, but I have even done work in the private schools, and what I found was because the teachers have all been trained in educational you know, universities and that, where they're trained in the same ideology, um, the textbooks that are out there, what I was talking about, there's no resources, alternative resources. There are some good content, but most of them are not written to the state standards or, or the educational knowledge and skills to where they could be adopted statewide. So there's really, we're, when I said they're driving the proverbial school bus, they are. Um, I, I've seen even private Christian schools use the same textbooks that are being used in the public schools either for lack of knowledge or the teachers coming out of that system and just thinking, oh, it's harmless. And so then it, Christian education becomes a secular education with maybe a prayer before the class, um, which is not going to equip the children to be able to be logical thinkers and combat the ideological indoctrination that we're facing. Critical yes. thinkers. Yes. Yes. Do we? Yes, go ahead. Um, I do agree. As far as a long-term goal, we should work on school vouchers. I would say, though, the immediate goal is next year's, in Fairfax County, is next year's school board election. And as you know, we just had an election. I, I believe that there are a lot of people out there who are Republicans but don't know it, and even last week they still didn't know it. But the point is you have so many people here of every background 
but in particular of uh, recent immigrants or people from uh, ancestrally from Korea, from India, and so forth, who are socially conservative. They may be yes. voting for Democrats, though, but they are socially conservative. Right. And that's why I really appreciate this, because we need to educate them between now and next year about these things, because that's what's going to help us with uh, the school board and uh, turning things around next yes. time. Absolutely, no question. This is one of the things that I think is the great failure of the Republican Party, having sat on the platform committee um, at the 2016 <clears throat> National Convention. I saw when we did the, um, adopted the policy to stand with Israel, a standing ovation. I saw when we stood for life, just you could feel the passion within the room. Those issues that many politicians, because they are politicians, will shy away from because they think, oh, you know, it's not politically correct or it might cause me to lose some votes over here. And yet it's the very issues that mobilize uh, a large group of people. And I, I agree with you, I think it's bipartisan because if you go into a lot of demographics that many times the Republicans ignore to their shame, um, you would find that they are very family-oriented, very socially conservative, uh, very concerned about the education of their children. And so we are losing because we refuse to talk about social issues and only run on fiscal issues. Chris, um, I think that you, you pinpointed the source of the problem, but I think that the solution to the problem is encapsulated in the Northwest Ordinance, which you partially quoted, and I would like to say the whole passage. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and other means of education shall forever be encouraged. I think part of the problem that we're, that's missing, that, that, we, that we've forgotten, is that we've forgotten the role of the school is to teach religion and morality as well. It's to bridge the gap between what is taught in the, in the home and in the churches and what is implemented in society. The schools are meant to bridge that gap. And I think, I think that um, that's one of the basic problems of why we're struggling as in the Republican Party is, is this issue of religion and morality being taught in the schools, not, 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 not necessarily the public schools, because I think the public schools are teaching a religion, which is also a religion. Oh, yes, so, no, no question. My biggest battle when I was on the state board was because there is religious ideology being taught within the public schools, and it is the religion of secular humanism. No question that it is being taught because you cannot teach content devoid of an underlying ideology. And that was the whole push. If you go back, and I don't have enough time, maybe Tim will invite me back another time, but I'll talk about, um, you know, you, you look at the, the push to control education, even within my own profession of law, how uh, Christopher Langdell at Harvard switched everything from Blackstone's commentaries to talk about the laws of nature and nature's God, um, into the whole case precedent, which is an ox constitutional oxymoron, because you cannot have judicially made law. But the reason they grab a hold of the secular <coughs> push for public education in its current form is to try to push out um, the whole question of, of religion and morality. And if you study George Washington's farewell address, he talks about the two indispensable support, uh, columns, pillars, were religion and morality. And Adams even said that our framework of government was wholly incapable of governing anything other than amoral and religious people. So it is very indispensable, but the framework of the compulsory, socialized, tax-supported education system is hostile to the instruction. And so that is why there have to be incremental changes to move to where there is some discussion. Um, and it's not just what we have right now, really, is a violation of our First Amendment rights, a free exercise, a free speech, a free association, all of these things, and they are being trampled on for the sake of socialized education. So we have to be very intentional. We have to weigh in to our school board elections. We have to. These are the most important elections that we're going to engage in. And we have to get our friends involved. We have to go into communities that maybe we haven't gone to, at minimum, 
You know what really disgusts me is the amount of uh, people within the church that are faith-based people that they don't even vote. I mean, we know the numbers, and they're not informed, or if they vote, they certainly don't vote in primaries and or, or in smaller local elections. And so we need to make sure that we're engaging them, that we are providing education. You know, have a small group, and, and um, okay, so, Shameless plug, um, one of the booklets that he mentioned, this is a very small booklet. I was writing books, and then I found out people in this fast-paced society, they want short little snippets. This is a booklet. It is basically, it's God's heart for government. It breaks down how our government is a republic, why a republic's different than a democracy, what the authority structure of government is supposed to look like, and why, um, how it infringes upon our liberties, and it goes back to our um, Judeo-Christian structure, which, by the way, is the safest protection of people of all faith. If you study this, you'll figure it out why. So you can go um, to uh, you can go to the the website at NERCAD, and you can if you make um, if you go on, I think you can go on and send an email, um, and you can request the booklet. We are uh, we are selling them for five dollar donations to try to. Uh, get support for the organization. Um, and you can also go to my website, Dunbar for America, which is my political site, um, and send me any and all emails. I would be happy to respond. Um, we just have to engage. And I just want to stop with this. I am very encouraged that right after a grueling election, that this many people are still coming out because we all believe and know that we have been given the greatest nation on the face of the earth and she is worth fighting for and we are the ones to preserve our nation and we do it by staying informed being engaged and making sure that our principles and our children are protected Thank you very much.